Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to you all with us here in this hall in Rimini and to those connected on our social media. Welcome to the uh, session where we present the exhibition, The Tree of Tales, that is presented at the meeting uh, of Rimini in the trade fair halls. Today, in this session, we would like to share with you a friendship, a friendship that uh, many of us uh, have had uh, for a long time and that has been intensifying itself during the COVID era. The friendship with uh, Tolkien, the great English writer, great man, and the whole group that worked uh, uh, on this exhibition, it was an unexpected gift uh, uh, due to living the unexpected time of history that we are all living. Today, we will be sharing uh, this uh, friendship. We have uh, three great experts of Tolkien in Europe. We have uh, Guglielmo Spirito, one of the pillars of our exhibition, one of the persons who made it possible to have uh, this kind of experience thanks to his professionality. And then we have uh, Lukasz Neubayet from uh, Koslin University of Technology from Poland. Thank you very much for being here. And then uh, we have Andrea Monda connected uh, online, director of the Osservatore Romano newspaper. Welcome. Thank you so much for connecting with us today. Andrea Monda is a very busy person, so it's uh, really generous uh, from him. Thank you, Andrea. So a brief introduction just to begin with. I would like to read a letter wrote, written by Tolkien describing his experience. I'm going to read this uh, briefly because with Tolkien it's always better to meet uh, his works rather than talking about ideas. And among his works there is this collection of letters that is really moving and you're invited to read. Imagine the experience of those who were born like me, paraphrasing the end of the 19th century, who experienced the whole horror of the First World War the perception and the imagination of uh, some kind of the security were torn away from us progressively. And now we are bare in uh, facing the will of God as regards uh, ourselves and uh, our position in time. We go back uh, to normality. A friend of mine, a Catholic friend of mine, told me when I was uh, complaining of the total collapse of my world that started immediately after uh, becoming 21 years old, that is, after World War I. As we've read, uh, Tolkien experienced the collapse, the unexpected uh, uh, collapse of a world. Uh, nobody thought that uh, the enlightened world of the 19th century could end all of a sudden. And this is similar to our experience in the COVID era. Something has arrived all of a sudden that uh, has uh, led us not to a destroyed world, but uh, has led us to normality. If you uh, visited the exhibition of Caron and Rowan Williams, perhaps uh, this is now this new normality, to be where, to be bare in facing the new meaning of history. And this is something similar to what happened to Tolkien. So today we would like to address what Tolkien expresses in his letters, in his works, uh, with regard to temptation and the positions of men uh, in front of these experiences uh, at the end of a world. If you read his works, uh, there are elves, uh, they don't have to do with uh, um, fairs, and Tolkien say, say that they uh, try to grasp a vanished world, and uh, they try to stop the flowing of time, and Tolkien says that this is a mistake. Uh, 
because uh, this is a danger that we also see in the Western world. Another temptation is the reform of power, adjusting things of history by taking power and, and engaging in hegemonic uh, actions. And then there is a third position that it is desperation in front of all of this. And this is evident in nihilism that dominates among many of us. The position of Tolkien is different. Uh, the method that God has chosen, he refers to Yuvatar, but we know that this is God because he tells us the method that God has chosen to live himself, to commit himself in the reality of history is none of these. It is the very same method that he requires of those uh, that want to follow him. It is not uh, a method of desperation. It's not uh, uh, other methods. Uh, and for those who saw the exhibition, Tolkien narrates this uh, in the cosmogonic uh, myths uh, in the Silmarillion that is at the center of the exhibition. It is the uh, core of the exhibition. In this uh, myth, of course, now we don't have time to go into detail, but uh, uh, what is narrated is how in the uh, work of God, that is the history of man, what happens often is that uh, creatures try to uh, add something of their own. And so there is a kind of mismatch, the crisis, the catastrophes of uh, history is uh, the cause uh, of uh, sin. Uh, the evil in the world is introduced by man's freedom, but in the Silmarillion, God corrects the mistake, corrects temptations of uh, men of being autonomous without destroying, without rebuilding either, or rebuilding the old walls, but generating. God generates something new. God renews his creation, and he does it in a very beautiful way that is creating new selves, new creators. I won't go into detail, but for every mistake, you see that God generates uh, in the darkness of the forgotten some eyes, some creatures, uh, humble creatures, that decides to start uh, a creative journey creativity that God generates in, in men's hearts that are open to receive that. In this meeting, we see a lot of creativity, not just in the exhibitions and in the sessions, but I think of the uh, creativity of volunteers, those who work in the parking areas and those cleaning the spaces. All these uh, actions are humble and creative uh, with which God can renew history. So what I would like to focus on today is exactly this. What is the method of God in history, especially in moments of a big crisis when all the certainties that we had one time have been torn away and we stand bare before the drama of time, our position as men of time before the collapse of everything, the decadence of everything. It is a condition of poverty, of desert, but as we will see later, God uh, gives a new um, life, some hidden life to this. We'll have uh, three steps into our session. The first uh, will be with uh, our friend Guglielmo Spirito, who will help us understand, better understand what we find in Tolkien in terms of God and his interaction with creation. The interaction of God with creation, as Father Guglielmo will tell us, always goes through the generation of something else. God builds by generating something else out of himself, and those who are open to follow him do the same. It is not just a part of something more, uh, something bigger, but uh, creativity is always generative. So I'll give the floor to Father Guglielmo. And just uh, as a way to introduce him, Father Guglielmo is a professor at uh, the Theological Institute of Assisi, and he also works in Rome at the university. I will mention the 
correct name, the Tolnanium University, and Father Guglielmo as well as Andrea Monda are pioneers of Tolkien studies in Italy. For a long time, Tolkien uh, was considered a uh, you know, general popular pop author in a negative way, but that's not the case at all. Uh, Father Guglielmo has worked uh, uh, for many years to try and understand uh, the thoughts in Tolkien's works. Uh, these uh, thoughts is expressed uh, in, an, uh, in the narrative, in the tales. And so I give the floor to Father Guglielmo and he will tell us about how Yuvatar can interact with uh, its creators to continue its creative uh, history in the history of the world. Thank you, Father Guglielmo. Un primo so, I think that uh, when we embarked on the journey to organize this exhibition, well, that was uh, something great, and only the force of a friendship uh, gave us enough strength to go on. And Tolkien said once that for the very same person to go through two world wars is too much, but the Second World War sees him more worried because of his kids, and especially for Christopher, who decided to enroll as a pilot of the Royal Air Force. In November 44, he sends him some letters, is very, very worried by for the, the security uh, and survival of uh, his child and uh, in, of his son. And his letter 80, 89, he says, I think that uh, you particularly need your guardian angel. And uh, I remember that I had a sort of vision in my mind not long ago when I was praying. And I perceived, well, I thought about the light of God. And in particular, I thought about a particle that is suspended, but millions of particles. But actually, I thought about a specific particle that is shining bright because of specifically a bright ray of light. But, well, there were no individual rays, but the existence of the particle in its position with respect to the light was forming a line, and that line was made of light. And the ray was the guardian angel of the particle, so there was nothing in between God and the creature, but the very same attention of God in a personalized way, not embodied as uh, humans tend to say with their language. I'm thinking about uh, a real person, and that gave me great consolation. This personal experience that is extremely specific and peculiar implies what? Well, beyond the level of confidence shared with his son, uh, he really succeeds in seeing a particle, a detail, and that uh, the source of light seems to cast a special light on that individual particle, so as if the individual uh, was very important. So if you haven't read the book, you have to read them. If you haven't seen the exhibition, you should uh, see it because, well, we do not want to spoil anything. But still, uh, he tells the origin of everything in his books. This Iluvatar is uh, the father of everything and uh, with his uh, thinking, generates the Ainors, the invisible uh, powers. So it sort of describes them as uh, strong angels-like figures. And uh, through their music, they're invited to generate a sort of harmony that they have to develop according to their, I mean, inclinations and uh, Talents. So there is this beautiful melody that unfolds, that gets more and more complex. And one of these powers that wants to detach from the source, so creates a dissonance. 
And this whole story goes on until the Louvatar generates a bigger harmony in the music in order to neutralize the dissonance. And then he tells these Ainors, you see, you have sung something and um, somehow he shows as a vision the world because one thing was hearing the sound of things, another thing is to what that. And uh, Eluvatar decides that this vision has to be turned into something real. And these Ainurs are so fascinated, intrigued by the result of the music and the vision, somehow a volunteer to enter this uh, uh, universe uh, and uh, to complete it, and they become Valar with their assistants, the Meyer. So it's like a cosmonic tale, a beautiful cosmonic tale of how reality has worked so far. So a universe, uh, a creation that keeps developing with the dissonances that try to uh, ruin the beauty of cosmos, but then they're somehow uh, neutralized. And then there are the uh, sons of Luvatar, so that are the elves and uh, the humans. And so the, uh, there is the wonder of uh, the uh, Meyer and Valier who are uh, somehow sort of amazed by that. In Cimmerillon, you find a lot of this. In the Lord, Lord of the Rings, all that was somehow the background. But one of these Meyers, one of these little sort of uh, assistants of Valor, is sent with others to be to, to sort of uh, to to the universe where elves and humans live to help them because Sauron kept on sowing the seeds of evil and Gandalf is certainly one of the most well known and Tolkien in his letters uh, uh, describes him as a uh, an Angelus, a messenger of the Lords of the West, sent to re rekindle hope. And one of the ways he uses is to somehow generate and triggers in the mind images of beauty that attract and are appealing. So the Myers and Gandalf, Gandalf among them, so interact generating sub-creativity in beings, and they do it in a personalized way. So with all the care for Bilbo first and then for Frodo. These um, wonderful mythical story has a meaning that can be theologically and philosophically justified. So I'm making some propaganda for this book entitled uh, Sky and uh, Earth. So it's uh, a book by Bulgakov. It's brand new, and this is the analysis of the thinking of one of the uh, greatest uh, um, theologians uh, of uh, the 20th century, and uh, is Bulgakov and his way of telling through angels uh, the providence of God, so the sky that is like the ideal projection of everything that will be, but when it starts to exist, it becomes earth. And angels uh, are the guardians of each single reality, entity, and being in order to make sure that each entity and being develops. Uh, is analyzed here with a theological and philosophical precision that has no equals. And somehow, this is a, a perfect way to describe the way Tolkien's reality is good gardening. And Gand Gandalf was also a sort of gardener. And uh, he was worrying that in some valleys, green grass could still grow. So the white tree should 
flower again. So there is a great attention for detail. So Gandalf is, uh, I mean, keeps uh, both his eyes uh, on Frodo and says, I'm going to help you bring your burden. And this is the role played by the guardian angel, as uh, Tolkien describes it in his letter to his son Christopher. So this presence of angels on earth in such a personalized way to help us bloom and uh, generate fruits is what gives us the courage to get to say I, because I'm not alone. I'm guided by some specific targeted love that uh, lets me go through dramatic situations, but with somebody else. So the sky and the earth are united. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guglielmo, for this first, uh, I mean, step. And uh, this gardening image tells uh, everything. To Tolkien, being creative is like being a gardener. So watering and irrigating, uh, I mean, God's creatures. There is this great deal of interest for the detail. What does it mean to be gardeners? What does it mean for each one of us? That means to somehow develop the potential of each seed. When God uh, sows the seeds, well, it's the, the very start. And then you need a whole life to have fruits. And now, Let's concentrate on the specific seed of Tolkien. I talked about voluntary workers. Each uh, voluntary worker has a specific uh, creative role. Each one of us as individuals have a specific creative role. And for Tolkien, this coincides with being a storyteller. And uh, Lukas is going to tell us about how Tolkien tells the stories before writing them. And so we want, first of all, to better understand what does this mean for Tolkien. So we had a first sort of a moment to see what God uh, does with each one of us. It lets us bloom and is our gardener somehow. Let's see what is Tolkien's seed. I give the floor to Lukas Neubauer, a teacher at Koszlanen University, and uh, he came from Poland here to Rimini and is going to tell us more about this. So, Tolkien as a storyteller, Tolkien, and his specific narrative uh, vocation. What is the seed that uh, he sort of uh, sown at the beginning of his life uh, and that would have bloomed? Uh, in his uh, second most read book after the Bible in the 20th century. Lucas parlerà in inglese. So, Lucas will speak in English. So, we're going to have a simultaneous translation. Thank you, Lucas, and thank you for being here. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. Italian, I'm afraid. Uh, otherwise, I would just be <laughs> using English. Okay. Um, um, Organising coordination with this uh, uh, with this event, with this exhibition, was um, also an academic conference. Um, the title of which is uh, The Tree of Tales. And I was intrigued by the words, uh, by both words, tree and tail. But I think that of these two words, the word tale is um, the most important one. It's frequently used in different contexts, but uh, I think that uh, when you think of Tolkien, uh, it, certain things need to be explained.
um, there are a number of books that incorporate the, the, the word tale. Uh, we know the tale of two cities, the, um, the Canterbury Tales and so on. And um, of course they are the written words. But if you look at the word uh, tale from the etymo etym etymological perspective, and you know talking was obviously a philologist, so he was interested not just in literature but also in the meaning of words. Um, so if you look at the word tale, um, it just happens to have the same root uh, as the word tell. The word tell, which means that uh, that you have to speak, yes? It's not just a written word, but it's something that is written. And naturally, uh, this, if you uh, think of the history of literature, this is the primary form of narration. Before there were any stories ever recorded in the written form, Naturally, they were first told by all sorts of poets. Um, um, naturally, when you look at uh, all sorts of publications about Tolkien, uh, I just use a selection here from different books. Anytime you come across the name Tolkien, uh, you will also find the word writer. Yes, he was the writer of uh, fantasy, writer of fiction, writer of this and that. Um, but naturally, of course he was, but he was also, we might say, primary uh, a storyteller, a teller of tales. Uh, we might even, sort of, using our imagination, imagine talking as a, almost a medieval-like storyteller uh, but naturally if you think of um, a poet a storyteller any kind of a person who's telling stories well naturally you need an audience and uh, I have a feeling that uh, Tolkien would appreciate of uh, depicting him here of course imaginatively as a kind of a medieval poet sitting in a, a hall and telling the stories, just like in the great poem, old English poem that he loved, uh, Beowulf, in which we also have the figure of a poet uh, telling an incredible tale of Beowulf's um, heroic um, exploits. Uh, we tend to think of Tolkien as a writer, of course, of fiction, but naturally he was first and foremost um, a lecturer, a scholar, and even his most famous um, academic publication uh, on Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics, um, actually started as a lecture. So he was first told rather than, um, and it was later on um, published. Um, Humphrey Comforter, uh, his uh, biographer, uh, writing about this uh, enormously important lecture, says that uh, in many ways, in, in, in uh, enlightening the, the meaning of the story, um, Tolkien was primarily not a philologist, not even a literary critic, but a storyteller. In it, Tolkien actually tells a story to explain why uh, the poem uh, is really a great work of literature. And then what else do um, academics do? Of course, they give lectures. So there are a number of uh, instances uh, in which we uh, can read of uh, what kind of lecturer Tolkien was. And um, according to some of his former students, uh, he could really turn a lecture room into a kind of a hall in which he would be, he would take the, the, the play the role of a poet and uh, his students will be the audience. Uh, on one occasion, one of his f former students and then later poet, W.H. Odin, 
said that um, whenever Tolkien was uh, reciting stories from Old English, in particular Beowulf, um, the voice, his voice was almost that, that, that of a Gandalf, of, of Gandalf. And then you think of uh, some of the other stories that uh, um, Tolkien is the author wrote. Um, Uh, we uh, we see that the origins of these stories are not always uh, they do not always originate in the written form, and some of them were uh, first told rather than written. Um, in some of the meetings with his fellow um, academics, the Inklings, such as C.S. Lewis, uh, we 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 know from uh, the notes, from the all sorts of memoirs, uh, diaries that Tolkien was, was a wonderful storyteller and that some of his early tales, uh, the, the, the books that were later published, including The Lord of the Rings, were first heard by them rather than read. And it was always a wonderful experience. And it was not just his uh, fellow uh, inklings, fellow scholars. Um, some of the stories that were later published, The Hobbit, Farmer Joseph Ham, the origins of them are quite interesting because they were first told to his uh, children. Uh, we find there's a lot of evidence if you read these stories uh, that uh, there's still lots of traces in them suggesting that uh, they were sort of developed as the stories that were told to uh, to Tolkien's children. Uh, not all of them were recorded. We know that some of the stories uh, only existed in the oral form. Yes, but definitely uh, Tolkien was a wonderful father and a great storyteller. And the fact that his children remember that, uh, remember that when, when their words were recorded, uh, testifies to uh, Tolkien being a great storyteller and, of course, a great father. Even if you look at uh, the, the, his most famous, one of his most famous books, uh, The Hobbit, you might find here and there some traces of uh, um, the, 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 the kind of uh, words that he might have used, words and expressions that uh, that um, may have originally have a, an oral, um, may have origin already be used in the oral form, um, like in these these opening words of the Hobbit. What is a Hobbit? Of course, well, you find such questions in the uh, in works of literature, but naturally, this is the kind of question that may have been asked by one of Tolkien's uh, children. Um, also in Farmer Giles of Ham, we have the original, um, originally published book. But if you look at the text that was, uh, that is earlier, uh, it wasn't published until many years later. Uh, we see questions such as, uh, you can see here, what is a blunderbuss daddy? So once again, this is the kind of question that might have been asked by uh, Tolkien's children. So to cut a long story short, and... Uh, write some kind of a summary. For Tolkien, telling stories was a communal act. Yes, naturally he needed some kind of audience and that might have, that obviously included his fellow scholars, his students and his children. Thank you. There is an aspect that Lukács started introducing on which we're going to go back and uh, it's the quote by Odin when Odin recalls uh, when Tolkien used to enter these halls in Oxford uh, so quoting Beowulf uh, by memory, by heart uh, and it was really enchanting and uh, 
somehow hypnotizing, let's say, his students. And so this is what uh, storytelling is about. And uh, for Tolkien, telling stories, and he tells that very well in his essay on fables, uh, reawakening in man that had been somehow reduced to brutal creatures uh, by modernism to bring them back to a sense of wonder. And uh, there are these angels described by Guglielmo that enter in the world with a, a pure gaze. And so they're always amazed by what is different. So the gardener, that is the founding image of what the... Uh, I mean, the generator, the creator does, uh, is surprised by the growth of the plants. You can't be a gardener if you're not able to uh, be amazed. And what Lucas said uh, has specifically to do with this, because telling stories means moving from an ideological approach on reality. So the approach that says that first you need to understand, first you need to have a doctrine, and then you can act. So this is the move to another kind of approach, a historic approach, where the doctrine, the truths, the values are developed on the way. So, and so maybe you do not understand everything of the story, but you keep, I mean, going on. And now we are going to have our third contribution by Andrea Monda. And I'd like to thank Andrea Monda, first and foremost, for having joined us. So we have presented an important theological, philosophical idea. But certainly, the piece of work that was most successful has maybe a few ideas, a little philosophy. But there are many characters. Uh, so there are many hobbits, and they represent modern men. They represent us. So Tolkien is always considered as a medieval expert, but the uh, experts of the uh, latest years uh, say that the hobbits is us. People who lost a vision of a global world, they see reality with uh, closed eyes. But still, there is the embodied grace, Gandalf, that arrives and is surprised by this mean, apparently mean and meaningful less creatures, and start with them this work of gardening. This gardening work means taking out the creative eye, the creative self from each character. So talking about hobbits means talking about creativity. But when we say creativity, it's not uh, creating uh, big pieces of work or doing something great. Being creative seems means something more general. Maybe the most authentic way to be creative is what hobbits do. They are very humble characters. But, I mean, uh, the Lord of the Rings is a parable of another big truth. It's the, let's say, the, the, the history. So to what extent God rebuilt the world through the weakest and uh, least meaningful creatures. And so let's talk about hobbits. What does uh, it mean for hobbits to contribute to the big sort of project of God? Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for being with us. And thank you for inviting me. Well, so thank you for letting me talk to you and leave aside things that are not extremely creative. So as you said, creativity is always a part of life. And working for a newspaper, I mean, is not that creative, but this uh, meeting with you today is a great moment of creativity. OK, I'll try to be as uh, easy as possible. So let's talk about. Uh, the importance of stories and tales. When I wrote my 
dissertation paper about the meaning of uh, the Lord of the Rings under the guidance of uh, Paul Gallagher, who had been uh, a student of Tolkien. I remember I analyzed all the symbols in the Lord of the Rings, and I remembered that the third chapter is entitled Three is a Company, and maybe that was reference to the Trinity, to the Holy Trinity. Uh, I wrote to Tolkien's daughter, Priscilla Tolkien, that I had met thanks to Guglielmo Spirito. And thank you once again, because getting to know Priscilla Tolkien was a, a privilege. So I wrote to her. And I told her what I was doing. My, I was writing my dissertation paper for you, my degree. And so I asked her, is that title, Three is a Company, is that uh, uh, a reference to the Holy Trinity? And Priscilla uh, answered me, and I just summarized it. What are you making up? No, 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 you are out of the way. You are totally distant. It, no, there's no connection. That title was referring to an old saying in English, two is a company, three is a crowd. So this had nothing to do with the Holy Trinity. Moreover, my father, she said, never talked about concepts or religious themes uh, in an abstract way, in a formal way, in a, let's say, solemn way. No, she said, he, she, he did all that in the medium of storytelling. So, through storytelling, so telling stories. Uh, well, I mentioned that answer in my uh, final dissertation paper, and uh, that was a, a very sort of important point in my paper. But again, when you become a journalist, uh, you then tend to be short and cut it short. So I'll be quite brief. So at the end of the day, the message I'd like to share with you can be represented by this text uh, that is pretty long. But then I will talk very little after reading this. I want to uh, say who the author is. He says, I think that in order not to get lost, we need to breathe good stories. Stories that do not destroy, stories that build, stories that help us find the roots and go forward together. In the confusions of voices and messages around us, we need human narration telling about us, telling about the beauty inside us, a narrative that is able to look at the world and events uh, with tenderness, telling what we are, so the, f the, the fabrics we are made of, and the intertwining of uh, threads. So man is a storyteller. We are, I mean, uh, we really need stories. And uh, stories influence our lives, even if we are not aware of that. Sometimes we decide what is right or wrong according to the stories we heard in our past. So they shape us, they mark us, they impress us, they can help us better understand who we are and what we think. Man is the only being that uh, needs to tell stories to somehow tell his life through stories. So we weave not just clothes, but also stories and tales. So you can weave texts. So the stories of each time have a common structure. So you can have daily heroes, including everyday heroes, when following a dream, confront difficult situations and combat evil, driven by a force that makes them courageous, the force of love. By immersing ourselves in stories, we can find reasons to heroically face the challenges of life. Human beings are storytellers because we are uh, engaged in a process of constant growth, discovering ourselves and becoming enriched in the tapestry of the days of our life. But yet since the very beginning, our story has been threatened. The evil snakes its way through story. How many stories 
convince us that we always need to consume, to possess. We become very avid of gossip, of what is false. And often on communication platforms, instead of constructive stories, which serve to strengthen social ties and the contrary fabric, we find destructive and provocative stories that wear down and break the fragile threads binding us together as a society. By patching together bits of unverified information, repeating banal and deceptively persuasive arguments, sending strident and hateful messages, we do not help to weave human history, but instead strip others of their dignity. But whereas the story is employed for exploitation, and power of a short lifespan, a good story can transcend the confines of space and time. Centuries later, it remains timely, for it nourishes life. This long text, and uh, forgive me for reading this. Did you guess the author? It's not Tolkien. Well, he probably would have undersigned this. But in January 2020, this is a message by Pope Francis and written for the World Communications Day. This very last sentence, a good story can transcend the confines of space and time, and so it remains up to date because it nourishes life, could be, I mean, uh, the catchphrase, uh, well, of to sell more copies of The Lord of the Rings because it nourishes life, uh, it feeds life, uh, it makes life blooming. It regenerates life. But here the Pope says, evil sneaks, because storytelling is fundamental. So the Pope message is to say that society needs to go back to storytelling. How prehistoric men did around uh, the fire. They, I mean, uh, used to cook the meat and maybe then they were telling stories and on this Chesterton has a fantastic phrase when he says in Eternal Man, man is the only creature that is also creator at the same time and some years later Tolkien would say man is a sub-creator because this sub-creator concept is a theory developed, and it says that man can do nothing but tell stories, create stories, create myths and tales. Why? Because it's a, it's a creature of the creator, the only creator, because, I mean, a man can do nothing but imitate his father. So do children with their parents. So does man with God. So if primitive man used to tell stories around uh, uh, a bonfire, so breaking the evolutionary chain, because it's a luxury, it's, let's say, a waste of time. What, why uh, should they tell a story? Because already, I mean, uh, preparing the food was, uh, was necessary, it was a pure human act, so, so, cooking food was maybe one of the biggest uh, revolution and uh, so men started wasting time somehow why because as talking says disease the uh, distinctive sign of our divine origin because we are sub creators and the pope says in this text that if we i mean uh, uh, stop telling stories the society will get lost and will get divided and will decay. But storytelling and tales are not the miracle recipe to to solve everything because you can also have uh, negative narrations, evil stories that aim at destroying the social fabric. Our life is made of relations that are weaved, uh, that are wo woven. So, Text comes from testum in Latin, that means uh, fabric. So how do we weave our stories? And then I'm finished. That reminds me, Shalom. So the big spider, the spider, 
What does a spider do? It weaves its web. So there is also there are also negative tales, negative stories. So there is also the attempt to enchant, to possess. And from this point of view, with this web, I mean, and we live today in a web, uh, tries to become the hair of the big black spider that bites, that hits the tree of tails and trying to destroy it. So, so, I mean, even the place where the hobbits live is not, I mean, uh, uh, protected from evil. And some is one that uh, is able to uh, kill the spider. It's considered as a, a warrior, invincible elf, is a small gardener hobbit. And uh, he wanted to see the world, to hear the elves sing. So to me, this is paramount. We need to do what uh, is uh, said in the Genesis. So what this uh, creator assigns us as a task when it comes to Eden. We are guardians and uh, gardeners. If we stick just to the garden role, we risk to become taxidermists, and this is the biggest risk. So we need to preserve, keep, and be guardians, but also at the same time, let grow, regenerate. So be gardeners, be creative. And the Holy Father uh, said many times to us working in the communication sector, be creative as if being creative uh, was a natural thing. We can do be nothing but creative. So letting grow, let, let nourish, look forward. Tolkien will define the Lord of the Rings uh, as a son that will live its own life and decided almost painfully. So maybe my son will find other friends, but this is what uh, uh, parents do. They have to educate, uh, try to let their children do their best and then let them go in the world. And uh, this very last thing uh, makes me think, and I say that pretty moved, uh, I think about the images that everybody saw. So these uh, Afghani mothers uh, gave giving their children to the soldiers. I posted uh, so the picture of uh, an Afghani soldier passing his baby to another a Western soldier. This is, I think, the, the, the most painful act ever, separating from your baby. But there, everything is so unfair, is so uh, uh, unjust. But I mean, what does a parent do? Just trying to lift uh, uh, their their kids, trying to let them go, let them uh, develop and not sort of uh, somehow be taxidermist of, of them. I've been the uh, director of a newspaper for the last three years, so this wall is a bit squeezing me. But Tolkien is setting us free. And I was asked, uh, is Tolkien up to date? Well, it's prophetic, I think. It's more than that. It's different. So. In an extraordinary way, with this medium of storytelling, he somehow shows us the way, shows us a new way. So the hobbits are, I mean, uh, they epitomize daily routine life, but he lets us see reality in a new way, in a new light. And so again, the the light is the key element to kill the spider. So those stories have already been there. They're always uh, oriented towards the future. You have a dialogue between Frodo and Sam on the, 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 the stories that never end. But my, my intervention is not a story, it's just a short speech. Thank you very much.
Siamo già arrivati ai 55 minuti, quindi dobbiamo chiudere. So our time is over. I won't even try to summarize. I will simply link up with this idea shared by Andrea Monda that I do share. And uh, Tolkien is prophetic because it is not up to date. I mean, because I would add Tolkien looks in different places. And the very first creative act is looking at something different, something else. And uh, I will end with a quote from a letter written in the darkness of the Second World War when, uh, I mean, uh, the pain uh, uh, was, I mean, spinning over and spreading everywhere in the Western world, like the tragedy that we saw in Afghanistan. and. There is, uh, it was hard to find uh, hope. Uh, listen to what he used to, re- to write at the time, Tolkien. What really matters is always hidden to contemporary people and the seeds of what should be, well, they flourish in the dark, uh, somewhere in the dark. So everybody is looking at Stalin or Hitler. So while everybody looks at what is, seems most important, but no man can know what is really happening. So sub specchio eternitatis. So uh, with the eyes of God, specchio eternitatis. So the gaze of eternity. So men have no idea what is really sort of uh, happening. So. What we know is uh, comes mostly from indirect, for, from direct experiences. So everything we know, and evil works uh, intensely, but always in vain because it just uh, prepares. Uh, I mean, lays the foundation for something that then will be changed by what is unexpected as it does in the world and in our lives. Thank you for being with us and thanks to our guests. Thank you.